Art, dear listeners, is precious, powerful, capable of bringing us face to face with hidden depths of our collective psychology, be it the written word, the painted picture, or the game. And few games have rooted themselves so firmly in our culture as the legend of Zelda. So it was that our oracles were basking in the familiar glow of their Switches, their GameCubes, their Nintendo 64s, the virtual expanse of Hyrule laid out for a warm revisitation, when suddenly they found themselves struck with curiosity about its most pervasive, its most ingrained, most intricately woven deeper meanings. And it was thus that the coming of Dr. Anthony Bean to our hallowed abode was heralded. Dr. Bean is a man who has dedicated his life to the careful study of games and psychology, and has even managed to utilize play to great success in addressing trauma, depression, anxiety, and other such maladies of the mind. He has since gone on to put pen to paper, inscribing his findings in his book, The Psychology of Zelda, linking our world to the Legend of Zelda series. It is our great honor to have one so learned so versed in so scholarly and philanthropic a way in our beloved nerddom as you, Dr. Bean. We eagerly await your company and conversation. And we, of course, and above all else, welcome you to the Fanatarium. Hey there, listeners. As Zach just said, we have a fantastic guest for you today. As everyone knows, I, I have a great interest in mental health. It is my job during the day. And I have a great interest in video games and pop culture, as that is what I podcast about. So today we get to combine pop culture and psychology with the uh, Legend of Zelda psychology, or Psychology of Zelda, by uh, Belladonna Books. And so with me, I have Dr. Anthony Bean, who is the editor of this collection of, well, collection of essays, essentially. Absolutely. So... Why Zelda? Why Legend of Zelda? What drew you to this? Well, this game itself, I have been playing since I was a, a young kid, and I've gotten to many, many times of trouble with playing this game throughout my life, and it's really been the go-to game for me for all of my gaming career uh, as I grew up, as I continue to talk to gamers, and as I see them come out, I continue to play them over and over again. And I, and I can attest to that one. Like, the game that made me... I played games before this, but the game that made me love games and love what games could be was, in fact, a Zelda game. It was Ocarina of Time. The mix of music and world exploration and, you know, the 3D polygons at that time looked amazing. Um, it's one of the few games that I've actually bought six times now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the reason they keep on releasing it over and over. They're, they're like, we found this sucker. We got him. We're going to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I can definitely, you know, I connected to a lot of this this collection, um, you know, especially music and so on. That is something that you, when you enter a, a play a game in the, the series, you know what you're going to have music wise, and it has a specific effect on on people. And the soundtrack, especially for Ocarina of Time, has stuck with me for was it two decades, two more than two decades now? Oh, it's so good. I even walked 96, down to ninety-seven. Yeah, I walked down the aisle to um, Zelda's Lullaby, so. It's it's been with me forever, and you know it's a fan favorite when you know go to like video games live, and of course there's a uh, Zelda in concert now, or the the God the Three Goddesses Symphony I think is the other version they do. Uh, it's definitely stuck around a lot. Absolutely, it, it has, and it, I don't see it going anywhere. Like even to um, this day, when when we went to my by we I mean my wife I and my kid went to a concert in the gardens over here where they actually played a bunch of um, video game music, and they brought it from all sorts of different uh, avenues, different areas, and different games. And they did a whole storyline through it. You could actually tell where each game was coming from. So you'd hear some Chrono Trigger, you'd hear some Legend of Zelda. You would uh, then hear some Gears of War, and they just told a story through it using the specific songs found within it. So it's super, super awesome. So when it comes to the psychology of Zelda, we know uh, we've had people on the show before. We've had Dr. Travis Langley, who, of course, uh, kind of became famous for starting some of these type of books with the psychology of Batman. And he teaches a Batman psychology course at Henderson. And he's Star Wars and some of the other. He's done a lot of superhero ones now and TV ones. So 
who made the pitch for Psychology of Zelda? Was it you or did someone come to you and say we should do this? How does this book come to be? So it was uh, actually me. I'm the one who created an entire uh, uh, large proposal. It was about 25 pages long and going through each of the different dynamics of each chapter. And then I started uh, going and I submitted it off to uh, publishers who I thought it would be interested in. And there's tons of different ways to go about and, and do that. You got to submit to publishers. You can try to find an agent. Usually agents don't take you until you have a a couple books out. It's the whole conundrum like catch 22 you can't do it because you that you might have a good idea but you don't have the the background to or the uh, the ability to show that you've done these types of things before so you know it's it's a process <laughs> definitely a process and you know um you know by, by now you know it, when it comes to you know, writing a book is different than publishing a, a paper in a journal they're very different things one has to sell and the other one just has to be accurate uh, as far as publishing concerned. Well, so for this one, though, being an editor, you're the one who compiles all the different people to make uh, essentially essays or different chapters for the book. How did you go out finding the people who'd be willing to write about Zelda? I imagine there's not a ton of people in mental health, at least established people, who know enough about Legend of Zelda to be able to write about it. Yeah, it was a, a bit of a process. So I am friends with quite a few people in the psychology field and who, who work on different projects, whether it's be uh, for Take This um, or for Geeks Like Us or something else. And what we did is we reached out to them and some people were like, well, you know, I don't know the series well enough. And um, or they didn't have a, an idea of exactly what was trying to to be done and so for that aspect we were um, attempting to make sure that we had a, a very broad audience and we opened up some of the chapters to to actually a lot of different people from internationally as well and we actually got a couple people um, that were internationally based at the time to write a couple chapters so let's say the the feminist chapter was written by the by one good friend but also melissa huntley and melissa lives in japan so they are definitely one of the more unique ones, and I think that they did a fantastic job of using the the idea of the feministic uh, point of view uh, when we talk about this this book overall. And you know, going through it, you know, some of the chapters there's the, the embodying the virtual um, hero, a link to the self, which draws on you know, like uh, well, I talk a lot of Star Wars, but camp Campbellian archetypes and the idea of self, um, which is also a strong psychology term. Um, the Dangerous to Go Alone, The Hero's Journey in Legend of Zelda, um, The Nocturne of Personal Shadow, which I thought was really fascinating because Zelda games, one of the tropes is you're going to have to fight a shadow version of yourself, at least in modern versions. And like, the idea of that, what that actually means, was really fascinating. You know, something I, I guess I knew in the back of my head, but I never saw it put on paper before. Um, yeah, it's um, it was a fantastic uh, poll. So when we did the proposal, or when I did the proposal into there, I knew that Shadow Link had to come in there because if we look at it from a Jungian standpoint, you have to be able to um, attack your shadow or be able to understand your shadow and come to terms with it if you are to understand yourself as well. So when we look at what we call an ego self access, you always have to understand your shadow or incorporate it on some level in order to move forward. If you don't, you uh, falter and you uh, fail <laughs> in a sense on lots of different levels. And so in order to to have that, we had to have a really strong chapter, um, which I believe Louisa Grand was the one who did that one. And she did a fantastic job. And she's just a fantastic person as well. And the chapter you wrote definitely drew on Carl Jung completely. Uh, the archetype chapter, the archetypal uh, attraction. Um, this actually, this is a concept that when I, you know, I, so I, I have a master's degree in school psychology, so it's, so it, it, we're, we, we're very close, but not at the same time. Um, <laughs> and so we, we take some other classes, but we don't. Um, but, you know, Carl Jung is one that we don't really cover very deeply, because in schools, it, we, we do more, uh, systems and family and CBT and we focus more on that. Um, so Carl Jung is one that we never really dug deep, but you know I knew the archetype uh, ideas, but the way you laid it out in your chapter kind of made Carl Jung make sense to someone who didn't get to dig deep into what Carl Jung does. Um, and I, I really appreciate that because you know you talk about how there's you know when we think of archetypes, a lot of people think of of uh, Joseph Campbell because he talks mm -hmm. about archetypes in mythology, which 
you know, it's very close and, and, and works. But you talk about, you know, archetypes of, you know, you have the beauty picture in there um, where it talks about paintings and photos and, you know, the sim- the symbol the symbolism of this. And I, I, you know, going through this, I thought of a lot of Zelda games and I was just thinking back at, you know, how similar they are. We like to call them tropes. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, these are these aren't necessarily tropes. They aren't just repeating things to repeat them. They they put them in there because these resonate psycho- psychologically in our brains. Um, yeah, absolutely. So when someone says the word trope, we're very familiar with uh, the idea of uh, trope. Uh, mainly, I think I personally think because of uh, Anita Sar- Sarsikin, yes. um, and because she would uh, definitely talk a lot more heavily about tropes, and that's when they started to gain a little bit more popularity. Uh, but another way of thinking of a trope is, uh, is an archetype, and if we look across anime, we look across video games, we look across just any sort of pop culture, we start seeing a lot of similarities, and we start seeing all of those things start to what we call coalesce. And those um, those symptoms, those um, qualities between those characters, whether it's the hero or the, the villain, they all have very similar things, which is where that idea of trope came from. But if you wanted to really go from what we call a phenomenology standpoint and look back to where it first came out, it's actually an archetype. Um, and so when we speak of the, the idea of archetypes, we're also speaking of uh, uh, tropes in a sense when it pertains to a character. Now, archetypes, I think, take it a little bit further. So with uh, Legend of Zelda... The, the concept of uh, the masks, you can actually see masks come into play across a couple games, not just Major- Majora's Mask itself. Or the the idea of um, having different cultures play a role across uh, multiple games. So when we look at it from an archetypal cultural uh, uh, perspective, we see those similarities and those ideas coalesce very heavily. And that's that's the idea of archetypes. Is I think it goes a little bit further be, beyond what we'd call the tropes, but the tropes are, are kind of a part of them. And one of the things that you dive into is how the different temples reference different archetypes and how the different type of archetypal transformations that he has to go through to conquer them. You know, like, uh, I believe the forest was, um, he needs to learn what he's up against. He has to reground himself and learn what he's up against because he literally fights pseudo Ganondorf at the end of Ocarina of, in Ocarina of Time. Um, the fire one's the destructive one that tries to corrupt him. Um, the water's the puzzle one. Um, you know, I, I love how you break this down into what these each mean. How it's literally he's trying to conquer a part of himself, become a complete hero, rather than okay, I'm in the shadow temple, things are going to fall from the ceiling, and I'm going to pee myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those stupid hands. <laughs> <laughs> so much stress. Yes, yes, and you just start seeing the shadow, and you're like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Why aren't you moving fast enough? <laughs> <laughs> and like how the lens of truth is literally how him trying, you know, he's trying to overcome death and be able to see reality by looking through a different lens or looking at things differently. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you, you laid this out in a way that I've never thought about it that way, but it makes so much more sense when you do. And I actually kind of believe the writers were probably smart enough to do this. Yeah, the, the writers were definitely uh, smart. And what, so what, the process of kind of editing a, a book like this is when the writers – create their chapter they then have to send it back and then you have to edit it and there's multiple times this has to happen so the to say each chapter probably went through at least three revisions um some of them a couple more because they were what we'd call two um higher end thinking like academic journals and that was not the point of the book and so we had to kind of push those ones back but when those come back i have to read it and make sure it flows on 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 point with it, but also that it's telling a story. The biggest thing that uh, these books are important in the, the reason gamers want to actually read it is because it's telling a story, using the story of The Legend of Zelda. And so if we can incorporate both of those things, then we have a really remarkable um, book that a lot of people will uh, want to buy or even want to even explore a little bit more. I can't tell you how many people have reached out personally via email and have said that, you know, I haven't read a book in 20 years. And I saw this one. I was like, all right, let's give it a chance. And I couldn't put it down. I've never had a book be able to get me to or anything be able to get me to read past whatever is going on dialogue wise in a video game. And they're they're just saying, congrats. You know, this is this is a big, big thing. And when it comes to psychology and video games, honestly, as far as like actual in-depth looks at it, you can probably count the number of actual like data-based um, or actual research-based books probably on two hands. At least, yeah. At least ones that are that you're going to find actually you know, in a bookstore. Um, 
And, you know, because when it comes to gamers, a lot of time, a lot of gamers feel, you know, I'm, I'm charged with a lot of gamer groups, and we talk to a lot of gamers, a lot of them feel pretty picked on because in research-wise, there's either, most research is either done by the, well, there's two researchers that do most video game research. One is very anti-video games, and one mm -hmm. is very pro-video games, and so the research that they do tends to be trying to prove the other wrong and be there, and there's very little just in the middle of us talking about, here, this is what we think, this is psychology, this is what, how this affects and this one definitely is one of the ones that sits in the middle. We're just going to look at it. We're not trying to say video games are bad. We're not trying to say video games are good. This is an effect it has on people. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I really appreciate that because, you know, it's been what, 15 years now since the two sides have started doing research left and right to try to make the other one look bad. And it's just getting annoying. It's literally the same two people doing most of the research. Yeah. And uh, if, if anyone doesn't realize yet, I'm on the, the side of uh, pro video games because I'm a clinical psychologist and we use it in uh, in our areas. And when when the gamers come on in, we're very front uh, up front with it that, you know, we're, we're pro video gamers and that we have a feeling that they can um, really help out, which kind of leads to the the other book that came out before this one of a clinician's guide to, to work with video gamers from a non addictive standpoint. Yeah, because. Yeah, it, 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 and, a lot, and a lot, of course, you know, look in the news, a lot of them try to grab on the video game research to try to prove whatever point they want to make or whatever is, you know, cool that week. And it's, I just like, it's really refreshing to look at a book that's just like, okay, here's an effect this actually has on people. Here's an effect that people do it. And the fact that people email you and it talks about how it resonates, I fully understand how that would work. It's, it's not trying to attack and it's not trying to be biased one way or another. It's just, here's what we think and here's what Zelda happened. And you got researchers who wrote very well. Um, covering a lot of topics so there was one topic that i did a listener did want to know how it wasn't in there involved the stress of trying to beat the uh, beat the runner for the mask <laughs> the cheater <laughs> yeah the cheater is is correct yeah that was uh that was the i think nintendo's attempt at trying to put a little bit of competition into a zelda game um and i don't know if it uh panned out as well Cheats as they wanted so it to yeah like literally okay i'm in front of him how is he at the end where did he go yeah, exactly. And it kind of forces you to be like, all right, well, I'm going to do this now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good good mix of, of what do we kind of see as the, the psychology. Nintendo likes to throw something at you that's going to be a challenge, but not unbeatable. Um, there's not going to be necessarily a hard mode that's like you can't you can not not do this. You can make it happen. You just have to give a little bit more try than the the normal dungeons of like all right, I'm going to Z target and I'm going to hit you and I'm going to put my shield up until the next thing comes out. You know the pattern. So they like to uh, make little mini challenges within it. Or use a game guide like I had to in uh, what was it Twilight Princess with the the zipper. The, the little gear zipper thing that you're on the walls. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. I, so I don't understand. Some of these puzzles are made for kids under 10. I don't I don't get it. I can't do it <laughs> as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> they are they're definitely uh, difficult but in a in a good way. You know, it makes you think. It is I think one of the things that uh, Nintendo does really well with Zelda is the those puzzles that you have is it makes you think about the concept and find a different way to to solve it. That's not just only one way to do it. So like with the shrines in Breath of the Wild, you, you go online and look for specific shrines, you can see 15 different ways to beat it. Um, and some are super creative that are, you're just like, wow, how did you do that? And some of them are like, oh, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense of, of how to do that. And building on like the chapter you heard about archetypes, literally the way Zelda games are set up is, you know, you get different pieces as you go to be able to complete it. And so you are learning to learn to look at things differently every single temple you go to. So by the end, you can use all those tools to beat the final level. And, but you know, if you didn't actually look at it, try to figure out how to do things differently, every single level, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to beat the end at all. It's not a normal game where like, okay, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to sneak through, shoot seven people and get through. It's literally every level you have to beat differently. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a it's a good thinking game, and I think that's why they it falls so nicely into that adventure action adventure uh, game, especially this new one. So I'm super excited when they when they announce what they're going to do with this next one to see what happens. So when it comes to this, I know Nintendo is extremely protective of their uh, copyright. Did they have any involvement in this at all, or give their blessing? Um, I know some of the past ones have said the unofficial guide or stuff like that. 
Absolutely. And so sometimes uh, saying uh, the words unofficial guide can help out if it gets too close to any sort of uh, trademark or, or copyright on on the something. But the biggest thing with uh, books overall is you can't stop someone from writing a book. You can stop them from using specific things if it relates immediately directly to Nintendo. Let's say if I had had the book named Nintendo's Linking uh, Our World to Z Legend of Zelda series by Nintendo, they would have come after in a heartbeat. They'd been like, yeah, you got to stop that. But putting a, an unauthorized um, a bid on it is kind of a little bit more, honestly, of a selling point um, <laughs> overall to be like, oh, my God, this thing's unauthorized. That must mean there must be some dirty secret here, right? <laughs> uh, and it's just a, it's a selling tactic that publishers like to put on there. So for this one, though, did Nintendo have any contact with you at all, or you guys reach out to them at all for any any things, or was it this, just the the experts, the the counseling or psychology experts that you brought in? So we didn't reach out to Nintendo on any level. We were very careful to uh, use lawyers to not necessarily skirt things, but we were the way that we phrased certain things makes it so it can't fall into those copyright domains. If anything, it helps out to build upon them. Okay. And has anyone who's worked on the games reached out to you going, you know, I found this book, I liked it, or anything like that? No, it's kind of hard to get them to, to do anything, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know if you've ever tried to contact Nintendo, but yeah, their, exactly. their, online, their online system is ridiculous. Well, they haven't um, really been an online. They don't they still know how to game online very well, so it took until the yeah. Switch to finally figure out how to make it quasi work it. Yeah, and so even just trying to get in touch with them, you'll get an email back. Be like, yeah, you know, this doesn't really apply to us, so have fun. And that just, I feel like there's their standard, um, standard response um, to everything. <laughs> so, well, that, well, that works. As, you know, as long as they aren't coming after you, that that works really well. So, another thing I, I wonder. So, this one definitely focused on the main games in the series, um, but with how big Legend of Zelda is, it's definitely one that could leave it open to having a follow-up if of course you get more topics um have, have were there ever any chapters or essays that you wanted to put in here that you just couldn't make fit that you might be saving for a future installment or anything like that yeah there are definitely other a um, aspects of, of different types of psychology this one was very um focused heavily on Jung, and that was very much Jungian. Um, which is which to me that's my training and so that that's a, a fun thing to to play around with to show that how one main paradigm of thought can be discussed across a whole bunch of different topics here and there and be able to really flush them out underneath one paradigm of thought now like say there's there's easily ways to do it with a with a cbt with a mindfulness tactic with a dbt um it doesn't really matter which which system theory you have system yeah there with his oh, family all the time and for it. Very, very easily. Very, very easily. And I think that's what we're kind of trying to do for our, our next one that we are getting ready to submit to, to publishers to see who may or may not want it. Nice. Nice. Because like, I was thinking about this one, like, you know, you could probably write, if you ever played um, one of the spinoffs, the, the Hyrule Warriors, um, which is kind of like a Dynasty Warriors, but with Zelda. You know, that has a dual, kind of a dual personality side of things, which is similar to how Darklink works, but not quite that, you know, we could probably write stuff about, you know, there's probably more about music that you could do. You know, you could do one about the concerts, you know, about the effect the concert series I've had on people. Um, you know, they're, 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 there's just a lot of things in there that you could do. Or, you know, stuff like, um, what was it? <sighs> Oracle of Ages and Seasons, where it's like two paths of the same game, mm -hmm. but you can yep. continue one from the other. Really? Yeah, it, I did both of those. Those were awesome. <laughs> like, there's aspects of those type of things that you could definitely work in. But, of course, the strokes that you put in this one definitely, definitely really work. Um, and, you know, I, I like, I think the major the music chapter is my favorite um, because I really connect to the music of The Legend of Zelda I've had my, most of my life. But the Majora's Mask one is one that I really dived into as well because that's one Zelda game that's, I own it three times now and it's trashed me every time I, I have distress <laughs> <laughs> the stress gets to me because i like to take my time and you can't um and uh you know that's one that i haven't been able to beat uh, but i keep on buying it and uh, you know this, the uh, you know the, the chapter about majora's mask and the masks and the power of you know how this all works uh 
I, I really found fascinating, and it made me want to go dive back into that game, which I can't dive into yet. I gotta beat another game first. But I, I really appreciate how that works, and that seems like a game that is just right for so much uh, just to pull out of. There's oh, there are so many games and sets in the series that we could have uh, been able to to use overall, but the it's so hard to fit everything into a a one book and. Let me tell you, trying to be like, oh, we could have gone this way. Oh, we could do this. Oh, we could hand, um, we could hand it into this capacity. And the publisher at that point is like, all right, you know, like you've got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's only so much room in a book um, that we can, we can do. And with, with every chapter being somewhere between three and four thousand words, they're like, you know, you can have like ten max. And I was like, but what about this one? They're like. Maybe I've heard a different one. <laughs> <laughs> like, there could even be a chapter about, you know, people that played Ocarina of Time and Shores Mask uh, remember when they showed a certain game that looked a lot like a more HD version of Ocarina of Time, and then when it came out, it was a cell shaded game, Wind Waker. Um, you know, just the effect of what that shift of look does to people's minds, you know, because Wind Waker has aged extremely well when mm -hmm. people came onto it, but, like, the fact that the change, what that change does to people and what the style of the game and how you, what you expect of a game really is kind of fascinating because then they dive, of course, into Twilight Princess and then they dive kind of back to the cell with, uh, with Skyward Sword and, you know, just cell shading alone has its own effect on people. That absolutely. Look has a definite change. Yeah, absolutely. The, the graphics itself are definitely one of the biggest things that I think will draw a lot of people um to the game and having the ability to to manage those uh, graphics to have it last longer is one of um, nintendo's always biggest challenges and i think that as they have gone from the the wii u to the switch i think they've found that sweet spot um of being able to be like this can can manage for a longer period of time if we do it in this capacity so let's say like, even with breath of the wild i think that's going to be great just for even like the next two to three systems easily it's going to age just age super super well if not go on to um do even more uh damage to the uh, sales charts as it goes forward so one listener question we want to know is um this get this book is very focused on the main console versions of uh, Zelda games. It does talk about some handheld, but not all of them. Um, was that just because most people who had who were writing in it had played the console versions, or was there just more rich environment to pull from from console versus the eight handheld games? I think there's more than eight. I think there's more than eight. Well, if you include remakes, I think there's definitely more than eight, and the, the randomizers um, that people like to create and then shove in a little cartridges um, as well. So with with those, a lot of people have not played, um, who wrote for the book, have not played those um, handheld ones versus, um, let's say, uh, someone who has loved the series. Like, I've played all the handheld. I have a DS, I have a Game Boy, I have everything. Um, and so I've played them all as they come through. And I, I can talk to those things, but when you are trying to get someone to be like, yeah, you know, like, like Spirit Tracks or, <laughs> or, or one of the other handheld, um, ones that, you know, is well known, um, it's really hard to get them to talk about something that they don't know. And you're like, I can guide you, but I can't guide you completely. And it would be a lot more work and effort to incorporate those types of games than it would be to just be like, all right, well, maybe this can be for something else later down the line. Because like, like Link to the Past and uh, the sequel, Link Between Time, Link Between Worlds, I think it's called, you know, that would that could lend to something very fascinating as well, the, the duology of that one. Or, you know, just the fact that Zelda splits off into three different timelines with three different types of characters doing three different things, um, mm -hmm. their, their fix of the timeline, so to speak. Um, you know, just the difference between the, how one event can change things so much depending on what happened. Um, that's fascinating that Nintendo thought of, and I think it would be really more fascinating to be able to get a deep dive into one event made it so there's three different timelines, and here's why this could lead to this, if this happened, this led to this, if this happened, and this led to this, if it happened, because mentally this is what happens. <laughs> I like how you just went in like five in because this. <laughs> yeah. Or even the the effect of, do you remember those CDI games? Mm -hmm. The ones that you had to like start at like six o'clock on a certain day of the week and you play for an hour with everyone and then you get the next installment a week later or something like that? 
Yes, absolutely. Now, though, most people have not touched those ones, so if you mention that, people would be confused. But you know, that, that's the, the communal aspect was really fascinating to be able to play together and try to figure out things together. But you're very limited in how much time you have to do it. Um, and the fact that they tried doing a Zelda game that way is, is really fascinating because like people don't play Zelda the same. No one plays Zelda the same. Everyone goes differently. And uh, which you've mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the fact that they try to make everyone do it the same at the same time. Ooh. It's really, really difficult <laughs> uh, to do that. <laughs> so um, going on with this one, which you said you had, some of the chapters took a lot of editing. Which of the chapters would you say was the hardest to to form into what it is in the book? Coherence. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would so I would say two specific chapters, and the the reasons are completely different. Um, overall, the the big one I think that took the, the longest would probably be the Triforce heroes and heroines. Um, and that is just because there was a lot of stuff to unpack in there and being able to, it used to be much, much longer. And so lots had to be cut out. Lots had to be succinctly uh, set up in a, in a way to where it would flow very well. Um, versus, uh, Shane Tilton's Asana of the Ritos, uh, chapter on music. Um, was too high a thinking. Like it would, like a doctor is going to read it. Great, that would be fine. But this book isn't for for doctors. This book is for the gamer community, and so this would not have been able to do. <laughs> it would have been very hard to um, to be able to manage to understand it if it had been done in that capacity. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the thing is, you know, being an academic, you want to write academic language that you're used to. You know, mm -hmm. like that's how you get things published. But you have to tone that down to, you know, the reader. And, you know, this re reading research, I read a lot of research. Um, but it always drives me nuts when I read research and I read the actual paper and I get to the conclusions and analysis and I realize, okay, this is what the data says, that's what they got. And then you watch the same people on the news talking about that, and they just basically read the abstract and took and ran with the abstract and didn't actually read what the data was because they don't understand that terminology very well. Oh um, no, they the news when the news gets a hold of, of articles, they're like, look at this thing causes terrible things to happen. And you look at the research and like they used correlational data and their R values, which is do you guys understand what an R value is? Uh, to the to them they're like, no, what is that? It's like it's your variance, how much is actually explained, which goes down to under one percent. So this paper probably shouldn't have been published because it's not a big enough um, thing to really even matter. And people just when we're talking with parents or other people like that and we explain those those types of ideas to them, it changes the way that they can um, understand it in a easier way to manage their uh, their ability to read the research and then understand what are these people um, trying to say and how much is actually being portrayed the right way or how much is just trying to get a uh, a read out of it or something else. So, have you noticed an evolution of not necessarily the mythology or the kind of the spirituality behind it, because that Japan's kind of stayed consistent with that one, but the evolution of the type of stories or characters that, that the Nintendo company has tried to put into Legend of Zelda games as they progressed. Have you noticed a, like an evolution of what they've been building up? Are you talking about kind of like the different characters and everything? Well, the different characters, like, for example, Link, technically he's different in every game, but like, but what they're trying to tell us about Link every t every game is slightly changing every time. Or like Princess Zelda, she has changed dramatically from early games mm -hmm. to what she is now. Um, have you seen that kind of a shift in what Nintendo's focusing on with their lore uh, over time from the beginning to now? I haven't played Breath of the Wild yet. I don't have a Switch, so that's why I, I haven't played that one. So I'm, I'm going to admit that now. And <laughs> I think that their, their way of of talking about Link and all of the other characters within it is they're still talking about it from what we call a myth mythological uh, standpoint, a heroic uh, idea, but they're talking about it from a different view, a different style each and every time. Um, and the reason they do that is because, let's say, uh, when we see a, a movie or Game of Thrones, because, you know, tonight's the season finale, yeah. and we see how one person changes over that, we're like, wow, you know, that's a really good story arc. But 
what would happen if we saw it happen in a different way or a different um, scenario or a different person watching this happening? Would we see the same things or would we see something different? What would be one decision over another? And that's kind of the idea, I think, where Nintendo is coming into play with these uh, these games and working from it from a uh, different arc style of the story point telling. And with that, they're able to to manage who is understanding what's going on, but also staying to the same truth of what creates and makes the Zelda games so so amazing. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, since I I, I kind of hinted at it before, one reason I really like the Majora's Mask one. It's because I, I actually use that chapter to help. Uh, I, I work in schools, middle schools, and so kids are. It's a rough time for a lot of children. Um, Absolutely. And Missouri's Mask one talks about. Uh, and I, I also live on the Navajo reservation, so there's troubles. Um, there's just difficulties. Um, and so working, Missouri's Mask one talks about how it represents the five stages of grief and how he literally you go through that game and he's trying to overcome depression and grief over losing Navi and so on. And I really appreciate that. And I, I actually had a kid read it because um, he was trying to understand how to help someone uh, close to him. And, you know, he got a lot out of it because he, he knew the game. He hadn't beaten the game. But he got a lot of he got a lot out of that chapter to help other people because he looked at it through the mind, through the lens of a video game, which he was familiar with the franchise. And because of it, he was able to understand concepts of grief, which are really hard to teach to kids. Absolutely. It's super, super hard. But if they have, uh, I think one of the best things that video games can do um, is that they could teach us uh, different concepts because it gives us a visual format. Like when we talk to kids about like, oh, you know, what happens when people die? What happens when certain things happen in a way that's just really hard to conceptually create for a kid who's like under 12 or even under 16 be like, you know, like this, this really impacted me in a way that I don't really even understand. I can't put words to it. But if you frame it within a video game of being like, well, how is it similar to happened in this aspect of this scenario within this, this game? And they're like, well, you know, this happened here and this person lost that thing. And, you know, they were really sad. And I was like, how does that apply to you? And then they're like, oh, whoa, I didn't even really think that video games were teaching me those emotional coping skills or those emotional understandings because giving them that visual uh, place to play from but also understand themselves differently is so, so huge. And, you know, connecting the fact that, oh, look, I'm playing this game and I'm crying at this moment. Why are you crying? What What is the story telling you? It's not just trying to manipulate you and crying. Literally, you're crying for a reason. You know, what you can do to overcome that. And, you know, some games, you know, Legend of Zelda games have done a really good job of hitting tough topics. Um, another series which has usually done pretty good on it is games like Mass Effect or even recently Dragon Quest and so on. They, they, they touch on it and they help you get through it, um, through these emotions. Some games just don't care. They just like, oh, we're going to kill up in front of you. Game of Thrones can do that sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that it can. Like tonight, we're probably going to lose a lot more people. Um, I have a feeling we're a feeling there should be a lot of people sad about this. People should be sad about last week. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it, you know, it it uh, one thing. Yeah, the Legend of Zelda doesn't just throw things at you for shock value. It, it'll shock you, and then it'll help you get through it. Which I think is why this game is so psychologically sound because it just doesn't do it to hurt you. It does it to actually help you through this and teach you about it. By the time you're done, you've gone through all these, you know, challenges, and you've you know, overcome them and you've beaten the boss rather than you're broken. You know, there's some games that like to shock you. This this doesn't do that. It it helps. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the uh, this game series I think is so powerful um, because of the ability that people can project upon their character and Link because he's androgynous enough so male and female can do it, um, and that he. Um, also goes through so much trauma in the beginning that he is able to overcome it. And I think that gives a lot of ideas of how can someone overcome something really terrible that happened to them and go forward rather than staying still and being held captive by that fear. And the fact that he's silent it makes it so he, we can be him and we can go through it with him. Absolutely. So, you know, this book is available on uh, Amazon. I'm assuming it's available on Barnes and Noble as well. Oh yeah, it's in Barnes and Noble. I go and sign them every week. <laughs> so, uh, do you have any appearances or con? You know, summertime's here, so it's con season. Uh, do you have any conventions you're going to be at, or people, or opportunities where people come meet you and talk about this book, or hear you say more about it? 
Yeah, absolutely. We are going to be at PAX West this uh, August. It's Labor Day weekend in Seattle. And I'm also going to be at APA discussing the powerful impact of video games um, and what it has on people um, to a bunch of clinicians. And so I'm sure that, you know, the anti video game crowd will be there and I'll be. I'll be in some sort of trouble at some point um, because they don't know how to think. The, the older generation doesn't necessarily know how to always think about something unique in this aspect. Postal 2 is not every video game. <laughs> and most gamers don't play Postal 2. Or yeah. do hot coffee mods. Or go around and beat hookers and get a bottle. Most people don't do that. Just because you can doesn't mean you will. Exactly. It doesn't ha always happen that way. But a lot of people talk about things that they don't always understand in a way that creates like, but what if this happened? What if a meteor hits us and wipes us out tomorrow? You know, like if we're going to play the what if game, let's play it all, all of it and not just uh, take one thing here and <laughs> think about other stuff. Like what if uh, football's teaching us to hit people? What if uh, basketball's teaching us that, you know, like losing sucks. Like what are we going to play all these things, uh, these what ifs that are going to really hone in and uh, impact us on on those levels and do we have the same same ideas uh, or do we have the same outcomes no we don't because a lot of people feel that they're like oh because well, you're integrating a, a controller into this that it must be terrible for you no that's that's not how that works um and let's let's really kind of talk about the the idea of what impact and important impact that these games can really have upon us and yeah, and rather than trying to focus on what harm they could do, instead focus on what good can happen. You know, there's a reason why Wii's were in every hospital you could possibly find. I worked in a mental health center. There isn't every single unit had a Wii, multiple Wii's. There's a reason why they're used for, you know, the, even the old, even the elderly had one, which was really weird that they were playing Wii. You know, they, they found ways to make it help people, you know, getting them interactive and actually, you know, talking and doing games. You know, I imagine VR will probably have a future where people can actually start using it. Uh, once people stop throwing up when they play games on it. That's, that's my experience. <laughs> and, I played games it, it gets a little bit better. <laughs> uh, I might, uh, yeah. My, my wife was surprised I kept it for as long as I did because I get motion sick and I was playing rigs and some of the other games where you're moving around and flying. It's like, I'm just going to vomit somewhere. Um, I did vomit <laughs> once, actually. Um, but, you know, there's a reason why these are there. And they don't just say we're going to bring Wii's in every hospital, you know, in the hospitals because we want to have people to play video games. No, they found a reason to make it work. And if it's used in places like that, there's, there, I mean, there's a, there's a good use for it. Um, you know, I suppose if the PlayStation had them, their, what's it called, PlayStation Move? The lollipops. If they the had lollipops. That, if they had done that before the Wii, you know, that probably would have been there. But, you know, there's a reason why they're still here, and there's a reason why people still play video games, and now they're playing video games more than ever. So it's, rather than saying, stop playing video games because it's going to hurt you, say, people play video games, how can we make games more helpful? To people, you know, like uh, one game that's gotten a lot of praise that we've talked about on the show before, you know, Hellblade's As Soon as Sacrifice, because it's very psychologically accurate. About, it's terrifying, but it's, you know, with trauma and about um, oh, schizophrenia and so on. Have you have you played, you know, Hellblade by chance? Yeah, I have. I've seen parts of it played. I haven't played it because I don't have a uh, uh, PS. It's a it's a it's a game. You know, I can't let my kids watch because they would just no. Um, but, you know, they, they found a psychological concept and said, we're going to make this work in a game. And they displayed it accurately. They got praise for it. And people now know more about that. But they put it in the medium of a game. And as long as people fo focus more on that aspect and try to make things work rather than how much harm is this going to do to people, I think video games are definitely going to be a lot more powerful in the future. We just got to get rid of that generation that insists they're all terrible. Well, I think that it, it's not always a getting rid of it, but well, also past that mindset. I, I think it's educating them. And one of the biggest things we find in, in like psychology that happens is when people get up to a certain age in their field and they become very set in their ways in the field and they don't always want to look outside of those because change is scary yes. and scary things make us want to run away from them. And, well, I, yeah, in being in the field, you know, I, I was involved with the people recently with the changing the DSM-5. You know, that caused a lot of fighting, tons of fighting, because we were making changes to the holy Bible of psychology. <laughs> yeah. And, and then some of them were great, some of them were terrible. But, you know, the fighting that goes on in that one, you know, changes happen, and we're going to keep on moving. And uh, 
you know, that, that just, the, just seeing that battle was, was really fascinating from someone who was new into the field at that time. People did not want to let go of mindsets that have been around for a long time. And that's the biggest thing with psychology, of course, is overcoming thinking errors or mindsets that are just not healthy. And, uh, yeah. And, and we would, when we talk to people on that, and when we train uh, clinicians in this area, we always tell them that, you know, you're going to have some biases to these. And that's okay. You can have biases, but you have to acknowledge them. Because as soon as you acknowledge them, it changes the way that this happens. And if you um, can't acknowledge that, then you can let it go. Exactly. So if people want to send you more questions or talk to you online, is there a place you want them to talk to you? Yeah, absolutely. I am on Twitter and always super active on there, and it's at uh, Video Game Doc. And uh, my email is uh, Anthony M Bean PhD at Gmail dot com, and they can find my website at Anthony Bean uh, dot com. Yeah, it's always something on there. Awesome. And I'm assuming, hopefully, in the not too distant future, we'll get an announcement of what the next journey is going to be because I'm I'm really fascinated to see what's going to happen. Yeah, we have a couple books in play uh, right now, and we are going to have some fun. But we, oh yeah, you know, it's it's a journey. <laughs> I look forward to seeing it and talking to you about it as soon as we get those out, because uh, 